on this Thursday night edition of New Center. South Korea expects North Korea to launch a long range ballistic missile in an abrupt manner. Tech giant Samsung Electronics warns of possible weaker earnings this year on software sales of gadgets such as smartphones, a trend that's also hurting rival Apple. And President Park shows support for job creation, especially amongst the nation's young job seekers. New Center begins right now. Good evening to our viewers in Korea and hello to those around the world. This is New Center. Job creation, it's a key priority for the nation's top office again this year. President Pakane showed her support for young job seekers today during a visit to the youth foundation she helped create. Our presidential office correspondent Song Ji Sun starts us off. During a visit to Youth Hope Foundation she helped launch, President Park Geun-hye encouraged young job seekers not to give up hope of finding employment. The organization was launched with a donation from the president after a tripartite agreement in September. It now has a budget of 110 million U.S. dollars, thanks to additional donations from other patrons. This year, the fund is seeking to provide customized services for up to 125,000 young people from mentoring to consultations on overseas internships at trading companies. One of its key functions is matching young people with opportunities at prospective startups and small and mid-sized companies. It also holds weekly job fairs featuring one company per week to guarantee that all applicants go through an interview. Upon hearing stories from a dozen people who have landed jobs through the foundation, the presence that youth job creation will still be a key focus of our administration this year. With the package related bills still pending at the National Assembly, President Bach repeated her call for labor reforms and vowed to create more jobs through new growth engines. Song Ji Sun, Arirang News. Now, at the National Assembly this Thursday, Speaker Chung Yi Hua's proposal to amend the controversial law on parliamentary operations is failing or falling short of winning a consensus from the country's main rival parties. Arirang News parliamentary correspondent Ji Myung Gil brings us the contrasting views. The ruling Senori Party on Thursday urged its opposition party counterparts to pass the parliamentary speaker's plan to revise the National Assembly law. If we don't reach a compromise on the current law, then the 20th National Assembly will come to a standstill, as we're experiencing now. Therefore, we must revise the law so the speaker has greater discretion to introduce bills. National Assembly Speaker Chung Yi-wa's proposal would restore majority rule to the parliament. Aside from that, the ruling party also wants to expand the speaker's authority to introduce bills. The main opposition Minju Party says the proposal is undemocratic as it eliminates a provision for bipartisan consent in the current version of the law. Empowering the speaker to introduce bills related to the economy or public security if a majority of lawmakers consent and limiting the amount of time for deliberations over a bill goes against the purpose of this law. We cannot accept it. Under the current law, deadlocked bills can be put up for a vote only when 60 percent of lawmakers are in agreement. Chong's proposal would drop the 60 percent requirement and allow a bill to come to the floor when a majority of lawmakers make the demand. The proposal also shortens the amount of time lawmakers have to consider a bill. The current deliberation time is at least 330 days. Chong suggested it be reduced to a maximum of 75 days. Chung agrees there should be limits on the speaker's power. He's also hoping his proposal will be accepted to bring an end to the current legislative paralysis. Lawmakers plan to discuss it at a parliamentary steering committee meeting on Friday. Ji myung Arirang News. Is North Korea planning a rocket launch? 
Well, satellite imagery collected over the past several days suggests so, reports a Japanese media, citing a Tokyo government source that it did not identify. Now, Seoul has responded to such claims. Our Connie Kim joins me live in the studio. Now, Connie, uh, some suggest that this launch could come in as early as a week, and the South Korean government has responded to this. Well, good evening, Kanyang. Responding to a news report from Japanese Kyodo News Agency, South Korea's Defense Ministry says that a North Korean long-range ballistic missile launch would come abruptly if it does. A spokesperson for Seoul's Defense Ministry says that it's closely monitoring the situation and made clear that any long-range missile launch by North Korea is a violation of the United Nations Security Council resolutions. North Korea's long-range missile launch would be a provocation threatening peace and security on the Korean Peninsula, Northeast Asia, and the rest of the world. Seoul stands clear on its stance that Pyongyang must not carry out such a provocative act. And the ministry did note that Pyongyang did not yet declare a no-sale zone, normally a signal that the regime would go ahead with a missile launch. But as nothing is certain with the regime, as you can see, North Korea's fourth nuclear test came without informing China and the U.S. as it has previously done in the past. Now, Connie, uh, since its last long-range missile test back in 2012, South Korean government um, has been assessing that North Korea has made some significant progress in uh, missile capabilities. Now, what sort of capabilities are we talking about? Well, it's important to uh, uh, note an upgrade in North Korea's main missile launch site in Dongcheongli, located northwest uh, in the communist state. Now, the height of the missile launcher has been extended to more than 10 meters to 67 meters last year. And with the extension, Pyongyang is capable of firing long-range missiles twice the size of the Unha-3, which was used to put a satellite into orbit back in 2012. As the missile would have a range of 13,000 kilometers, it would pose a direct threat to the United States as it could reach the east coast of the United States. And the reason why Seoul says the missile launch could be an abrupt one is because it's hard to keep track of the North's missile launch preparations. Now, the launch pad has been covered while operations at the site are mostly automated and rails to the launch site have been set up to quickly transport uh, rocket components. And U.S. officials have also said recent satellite imagery shows increased movements of personnel, rocket-related equipment and fuel into the facility. Um, Connie, this latest uh, piece of speculation comes amid uh, various countries are putting their heads together to come up with an unprecedented level right. of sanctions for North Korea uh, for its nuclear test uh, early this month. Now, how is the global community reacting to this uh, possibly imminent uh, missile threat? Well, first of all, possible new, uh, launches of a North Korea's long-range missile uh, test leaves China worried the most. Now, Beijing, Pyongyang's close ally, has been against the idea of slapping a new set of heavy sanctions following North Korea's fourth nuclear test. But if the North decides to fire a long-range ballistic missile at this time, it would strain Beijing's patience with Pyongyang facing tougher sanctions. China's foreign ministry says it's also monitoring the situation and has warned North Korea of raising tensions in the region. Take a listen. We believe that North Korea's recent nuclear test has increased complicated factors to the situation on the Korean Peninsula and the Northeast Asian region. China has paid great attention to the current situation and is deeply worried about the development. Japan has also convened an emergency meeting to discuss response measures against North Korea's possibly imminent long-range missile launch. Tokyo is reportedly reviewing to implement its own anti-missile system against any North Korean missile entering into Japanese airspace. A Japanese senior official says Tokyo will continue to work closely with its allies to gather information related to Pyongyang's move. We will continue to work closely with countries such as South Korea and the U.S. while gathering information and being at alert to protect the United Nations Security Council's decisions and the joint statement by the six-party talks. A U.S. official has urged North Korea to refrain from actions and rhetoric that threaten peace and security inside the region.
Well, um, you know, everyone's patience is wearing thin vis-a-vis uh, -vis regarding North Korea, and uh, that includes China, North Korea's only ally. So we'll have to wait and see what North Korea's next move will be vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the world. Exactly. All right. Thanks, Connie, for coming in tonight. My pleasure. Now, if Pyongyang does indeed go ahead with any more rocket launches, the reclusive state will surely face even stronger sanctions from the international community, which is already mulling a never-before-seen kind of retribution for its recent nuclear test. Our foreign affairs correspondent, Kwon Soa, has more on the price the regime might pay should they go ahead with another missile test. North Korea's ballistic missile tests violate UN resolutions, just as its recent nuclear test did. So if it really is about to test fire a missile, as recent reports suggest, the regime could be facing even heavier consequences. There is a chance the international community could seek ways to ratchet up the sanctions against North Korea to a much higher level than they would for just a nuclear test. China could also strengthen its position. That remains to be seen, though, especially as the U.S. and China, both permanent members of the U.N. Security Council, have so far failed to narrow the gap on the degree of sanctions that will be imposed, even after talks between U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry and Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi on Wednesday. On top of that, five of the countries involved in the long-stalled six-party denuclearization talks have also failed to find consensus on a proposal made by President Park Geun-hye last week to resume the multilateral form without North Korea. The U.S. has expressed support for it, and China and Russia have dismissed the idea. From the start, we knew that China and Russia have had a passive point of view when it comes to this issue. But due to the severeness the fourth nuclear test brings, now is the time when the five-party talks need to be reviewed. As Foreign Minister Yun byung se had mentioned, it's the path towards reviving six-party negotiations. Amid the multilateral efforts to curb North Korea's nuclear ambitions, the UN Security Council's 15 members are working on a new North Korea resolution for the recent nuclear test. While the general consensus on denuclearizing North Korea is there, with China and Russia on a different page than their six-party counterparts, experts say it could be a while until new and stronger sanctions are adopted. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. On that note, Chinese President Xi Jinping expressed mild dis dissatisfaction with the recent visit by U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, who pressed Beijing to play a bigger role on North Korea. Shin Semin has the details. According to a statement posted on the Chinese Foreign Ministry website, President Xi Jinping told U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry on Wednesday that cooperation between the two world powers could be a win for both sides that contributes to peace, prosperity, and stability in the world. In other words, China wants balanced relations with the U.S. on pressing issues like regional security and the North Korea nuclear issue. China also wants Washington to consider its position on these matters. The remarks come after Kerry met with Chinese officials on Wednesday to discuss the U.S.-led U.N. Security Council resolution that's being drafted against North Korea. The two superpowers are at odds over whether harsher sanctions should be imposed on Pyongyang. China, a veto-wielding permanent member of the U.N. Security Council, does not want to sanction its longtime ally so heavily. Experts say a proposal by Washington to cut crude oil exports to the north will only cause chaos on the Korean Peninsula and in China. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Samsung Electronics has warned of possible weaker earnings this year due to softer sales of electronics ranging from televisions to personal computers and smartphones. It's a global trend that's also hurting rival Apple and major chip makers. And analysts say 2016 is going to be even more challenging. Our Kim min -ji explains why. Korea's biggest tech firm saw its profit fall sharply in the fourth quarter of last year. Samsung Electronics says its net profit came to 2.7 billion U.S. dollars in the October to December period, down almost 40 percent from a year ago. 
Operating profit for the fourth quarter rose 16 percent on year to over $5 billion, while sales edged up over 1 percent to $44 billion. The latest results reflect an industry-wide slump in the technology sector worldwide, stemming from weak global demand for electronic goods. A day earlier, Apple also said it expects sales in the current quarter to drop for the first time in over a decade. This is expected to dent Samsung's earnings even further as the company makes components for the U.S. company. Profit in the chip sector fell more than expected despite seasonal demand, while sales in smartphones have been slowing. On top of that, there's been a supply glut and prices have fallen. Samsung also continues to face fierce competition with Chinese rival companies, and there's been unfavorable exchange rates, indicative of a tough road ahead for the tech giant. Analysts expect the weak performance to continue throughout the first quarter of this year due to a slump in its mobile and chip business, though most are withholding judgment until after the release of the Galaxy S7. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. Korea is moving fast to broaden its economic ties with Iran in the wake of a landmark nuclear agreement that lifted international sanctions on the oil-rich country. Well, uh, there are many factors that need to be ironed out first including maintaining the current Korean won-based account settlement system and adding other currencies such as the euro. Our Lee ji reports. Officials from Korea's finance ministry, foreign ministry and banks will meet with their Iranian counterparts during a three-day trip that starts Saturday. According to financial institutions on Thursday, their talks will focus on maintaining the Korean currency payment system and expanding the payment system to include euros and other international currencies. The system is an alternate channel through which Korea and Iran have been able to do business since sanctions restricted all financial transactions with Iran in 2010. Under the system, Iran has accounts in Korean banks to facilitate trade in oil and other exports. Back then, when oil prices rose along with the increase in Korea's oil imports, the balance in the accounts grew massive, with the current amount estimated to be between two and a half and three and a half billion U.S. dollars. Earlier reports indicated that Iran might be planning to withdraw its money, sparking concerns in government and financial circles, as a move like that would have a significant impact not only on Korean banks, but could also increase the uncertainty for Korean companies seeking to do business in Iran. But the Korean government dismissed such speculation, and some experts added that Iran is not likely to take such risky action just after being freed from international sanctions. Lee Ji-won, Arirang News. Asian shares closed in mixed territory today despite an overnight plunge in Wall Street. The drop in U.S. shares came after the Federal Reserve gave no clear indication of when it might start li lifting rates again and decided to keep the benchmark rate steady for this month. Huang Jihei has the details. Shares in Asia opened to a rough start but closed in mixed territory on Thursday. Japan's Nikkei dropped 0.7 percent while Korea's benchmark Kospi shrugged off earlier losses and ended half a percent up. In China, the Shanghai Composite fell almost 3 percent. The choppy trading in the region follows a sharp dive on Wall Street where investors were hoping for a stronger sign from the Fed that could dismiss chances of a rate rise in March. The S&P 500 closed down over 1 percent, while the Nasdaq dropped more than 2 percent. And I think from an equity market perspective, where companies have been facing difficult pricing power, difficult global economic conditions, difficult domestic economic conditions, having a Federal Reserve that's not your cheerleader is just not well received, and that's why we're having the response we're having from the markets. The U.S. Federal Reserve opted to hold its key rate steady on Wednesday, saying it was closely monitoring global financial developments and how they might affect the U.S. labor market and inflation. Plunging oil prices coupled with the slowdown in China resulted in a massive sell-off in global stock markets early this year. While this turmoil had fueled speculation that the Fed may back away from its plan to tighten its monetary policy this year, the central bank gave little indication of when it will raise rates again. Last month, the Fed increased rates for the first time in almost a decade and suggested four more rate hikes this year. 
With the latest Fed statement, volatility remains in the markets, although analysts widely believe a second rate hike in the first quarter will be unlikely. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Well, we're all familiar with chess playing computers. Deep Blue uh, famously beat uh, Gary Kasparov 20 years ago, but the ancient game of Go, which is known as Paduk in Korea, is considered a more significant challenge for artificial intelligence because the overwhelming complexity makes it an intuitive game. A new program has beat that challenge, and a huge match of Go or Paduk is expected to take place between the world's longtime Paduk Grandmaster, human Isedol, and AlphaGo, a computer program developed by Google. Our Kim ji reports on why such development makes it a milestone in AI. Up until now, the ancient game of Go or Paduk has been singled out as a board game that computers couldn't crack due to its complexity. The rules are simple, though, which is to gain the most territory of the grid by placing or capturing black or white stones, which can be placed in an almost indefinite number of combinations. But this belief may soon change. U.S. tech giant Google says its computer has a 50-50 chance to beat some of the strongest Paduk players in the world when equipped with an artificial intelligence program called AlphaGo, developed by Google's London-based company DeepMind. Google says AlphaGo is trained to learn like a human being by observing others play and repeatedly predicting the outcome of each game, as well as by using its instincts to make the best move in uncharted situations. This gut instinct is what makes AlphaGo more advanced compared to previous software programs, including IBM's chess supercomputer Deep Blue which beat Russian chess champion Garry Kasparov in 1997 by learning to use a general-purpose algorithm to interpret the game's patterns. Google says AlphaGo has already defeated European Paduk champion Fan Hui five times out of five tournaments in October. Co-founder of DeepMind, Demis Hassabi, says the ultimate goal of AlphaGo's development is to apply it to solve real-world problems in the future. You know, maybe you get a, uh, a scan, a CT scan or a brain image, uh, and you have to process that, uh, um, that image and maybe recognize something that's wrong in that, in that um, image. Uh, and then uh, help work out what the best um, uh, traje- kind of treatment uh, schedule should be. The verdict will be out as AlphaGo is to play against a decades-long Korean champion and Paduk Grandmaster Isador in Seoul this March. The winning side will be awarded a million U.S. dollars as prize money. But whatever the outcome, one thing's for sure is that the upcoming match will be a milestone in the development of artificial intelligence. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Well, gut instinct by a machine, I don't know if I like that. But as clearly evidenced by drastic developments in AI, change is underway. A perfect storm of business model change in all industries, resulting in major disruptions to labor markets. That is what's expected in the near future, according to the World Economic Forum's report on the future of jobs. Now, how so and what needs to be done to better prepare ourselves for this rapid change? Our news feature tonight with Kwon Jang Ho. Siri, remind me to pick up my dry cleaning after work today. Okay, I'll remind you. Siri is a useful tool, but it's not really ready to replace the role of a human purse assistant just yet. That is where the technology is heading. At the World Economic Forum in Davos last week, Stuart Russell, a leading expert in computer science, suggested that in the future, artificial intelligence would become the ideal personal assistant, perform better than humans, and be available to all. We're talking about a system uh, which is there on your shoulder uh, and can provide advice and help you navigate the complicated world. But perhaps that future is already here. A study last year found that between 2001 and 2013, personal assistant jobs in the UK had fallen by 45%. Other occupations such as library assistants and travel agents also saw huge declines. The report concluded that the losses were mainly among jobs where productivity had been greatly improved by technology. 
Jobs which are standardized, repetitive, and involve patterns are jobs that will be taken over by artificial intelligence and robots. For instance, in the U.S., 75 percent of Wall Street training is being made by computers. Even in journalism, sports, and finance, news reports can be produced by AI autonomously. Researchers at the University of Oxford in 2013 said that 47 percent of jobs in the U.S. could potentially be done solely by machines within 10 to 20 years. The study also said that any job that involves a little social intelligence, creativity and perception is at risk. Further studies showed that Korea is especially at higher risk of losing jobs, as it has been estimated that 63 percent of the country's workforce could be computerized. Our research found that it's a very risky situation, far more so than that in the U.S. and other developed countries. The reason is because the ratio of Korean jobs that involve simple manual skills or office administration work is higher than other places. But the research paper offers hope in that new fields will open up, especially in IT and software development. The social business networking website LinkedIn put together a list of the top 10 job titles that barely existed before 2008. Eight out of 10 were from digital industries, with iOS and Android software developers coming out on top. Academics and business leaders agree that the changing nature of the job market in general cannot be stopped and that the next task in hand is for society to adapt to such changes. Those already working will need to go through a re-education. Moreover, they need to study new fields in order to survive. And for that, universities and the government need to provide related courses or financial support. And agreed training is responsibility for the corporation. Mm -hmm. If we know the future, and I think we're almost crystal clear that we know the future, that's mm -hmm. what we're talking about, that we have to start to retrain the people. Mm -hmm. And also we have to work with the government mm -hmm. to really uh, create the future talent to be more adapted to the future trend. The fourth industrial revolution is coming. It should make our lives easier, better, and more productive. But for some of us, it might not happen if our jobs and livelihoods become collateral damage. To prepare for it, more steps need to be taken by governments, businesses, and of course, ourselves. Kwon Jao, Arirang News. The dream of a new life in Europe is becoming more unattainable for many asylum seekers as countries reverse open door policies for refugees. Bruce Harrison is live in the studio with me. Bruce, uh, Sweden has announced that it may deport up to 80,000 asylum seekers. That's right, Kun Young. This would certainly be a massive effort if they were able to accomplish it. And when um, an Interior Minister Anders Ijman announced that figure today, he said the government is going to need way more resources to get it done. A Swedish newspaper, a Swedish daily rather, reports the government's approving applications for about 55 percent of asylum seekers right now in Sweden and projecting 45 percent. The announcement from Sweden is the latest example of a Europe struggling to cope with the 1.1 million people that flooded in from war-torn countries last year. Earlier this week, Denmark's parliament passed measures to deter refugees from seeking asylum, including confiscating valuables to pay for their stay. I'm so sorry about these new rules, and it's really bad that the Danish parliament had come out with difficult and harder rules. Meanwhile, in Germany, many Iraqi refugees have given up on their applications and are returning home with the governments battling the Islamic State. The International Criminal Court embarks on a major task today, hearing the case of a former Cote d'Ivoire president, Laurent Gbagbo. Bangbo is the most senior politician to be tried at the Global War Crimes Tribunal since it was formed 13 years ago. Mr. Bangbo faces charges of unleashing a civil war in Cote d'Ivoire that killed 3,000 people after refusing to accept defeat in the 2010 presidential election. The prosecution said it's investigating from all sides. We have uh, 138 witnesses, including insider witnesses, crime-based witnesses, and uh, expert witnesses. So this is uh, uh, what we will be presenting to the, the judges. 
The court was established to charge the gravest international crimes, but has so far just handed down two convictions, both of little-known African warlords. Well, Bruce, in other news, um, people turn to all kinds of objects for, for good luck. You know, you have uh, good luck charms, bracelets, necklaces, and evil eye even. But in Thailand, a new trend is emerging amongst people uh, to cope with lagging economy. And, and these uh, good luck dolls, they look quite real. They do look really real, but um, that's part of the charm, Kun Young, because a uh, superstitious trend there involves carrying these dolls, taking them around, uh, and, and pretending to feed them as if they were real children. Uh, people believe they're inhabited by children's spirits and bring good luck and wealth to those who care for them well. She gave me a better life. She helped me earn more income from when I earned very little. I've won many lotteries. And for those lifelike qualities, dolls can cost anywhere between 40 to 800 U.S. dollars. Wow. Um, Bruce, is this trend expected to stick around? It's unclear, I guess, at this time, but um, a lot of people are benefiting, not just the doll owners. You have the companies producing the dolls, and then you have even budget airlines taking advantage of the trend. They're offering the dolls seats and meals along with the other passengers. Wow. Well, I guess it could be a you know, business model for some companies like that, but for the people, it's really um, it's real for them, right? These d dolls are cherished deeply, and some believe that they're actually reaping benefits from just taking care of them. All right. Well, Bruce, thank you so much for that today. My pleasure. Well, it was a cloudy day here in Seoul, but conditions were certainly mild enough to enjoy being outdoors for a stroll. For more, let's go over to our Chi Hyun at the Weather Center. Hello, Gunyang. Well, while it was a cloudy day here in Seoul, the southern provinces are seeing rain since early this morning. And rain will continue in the southern regions tomorrow. That's right. The southern regions will take in all the precipitation at least for another day as this low pressure system will stick around in the southern parts of the country for the next few days. And parts of Gangwon-do province will also be under the influence of this system. And due to relatively cold temperatures, the eastern parts of Gangwon-do province will see snow of up to 10 centimeters, while Jeju Island will see rainfall up to 40 millimeters and the rest of the southern provinces will see somewhere between 5 to 20. But again, the rain could turn into snow once the temperatures go down. And temperature-wise, today's clouds will keep the temperatures mild overnight in the capital areas as the daily low here in Seoul will start out at minus 1 degree Celsius. One for Daegu and Busan and Jeju will start out at 4 and 7. And as for the daily highs, here in Seoul will top out at 5 degrees Celsius, 4 for Daegu and Busan and Jeju will see a high of 7 and 9. Now that's Korea for you, and here's a look at the weather conditions around the world. And that is our broadcast on this Thursday night. I'm Moon Gan Young. Thank you everyone for watching, and we hope to see you right back here, same time tomorrow on News Center.